Gaskins, I'm the facilitator or coordinator for the Bay Area ASCAC Lecture Committee. Tonight's guest is a brother who I'm, whom I admire very much, um, and he's actually a mentor of mine. Most of you know him for his outstanding and pioneering work in the African presence in Asia and the Pacific Islands. But tonight, he will do something a little different for us. The African called Moors. Brother Renoko has a long bio, and in the interest of time, I won't I won't go through all of it. Maybe we can have some time afterwards, and I can talk about it. Uh, if that's okay with you, Brother Renoko. Bye. Okay. So, without any further ado, uh, brothers and sisters, would you please stand and give a warm, welcoming applause for Brother Renoko Rashid. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be here uh, once again in Wose, uh, at Wose Community Church. And I'm particularly grateful to ASCAC for, or the local ASCAC study group for inviting me to come up here. Uh, I'm especially grateful to Brother Naeem, who's worked very hard to put this together. And uh, so far, and I'm sure will continue to be the rest of the weekend, a, a wonderful host. Um, I think the local ASCAD group and Brother Naimi in particular deserve a round of applause. It's very important to um, acknowledge that because if you're not involved, you don't know how hard it is to put together a program like that. Uh, whether you be a student or you're working in the community, in the academic community, whatever the case may be. Um, I hadn't planned to really say that, but just looking at all the energy that goes into it, you know, it is important to acknowledge that because sometimes people get tired, even if you are very, very committed. You know, you need that kind of reinforcement. You not only need a round of applause, but we need that kind of working unity so that this becomes not just a lecture occasionally on a Saturday evening, but it in fact becomes a way of life. That this is the sort of thing that we talk about on a regular basis, that we incorporate in our curriculums. Uh, we make sure that it's on television, and we don't confine it to a lecture or a seminar or a conference or the shortest, coldest month of the year, February. We are people with the most to talk about historically. In fact, for most of the history of the world, uh, humanity is only African or black people. Europeans, as we know it, you know, the, even the first Europeans were black. <laughs> But Europeans, as we know them today, only come into Caucasoid people, you know, white people, that European. has only been in existence 25,000 years. And then you find what would appear to be a prototype of Far East Asians, according to the works of Shekhan to Diop, only come into being about 15,000 years ago. That all modern humanity emerges out of Africa beginning about 100,000 years ago and spreads to the far corners of the earth. This is based on studies, uh, genetic studies, from Bosnia, Herzegovina, to the Bay Area, where all modern human beings come out of Africa and move into the other parts of the world, where they begin to lose, you might say, some of those original Africoid characteristics, that Africoid phenotype. And in places like Europe, beginning about 40 to 50,000 years ago, and that process continuing until about 25,000 years ago, you do have ice age kinds of conditions that uh, take place periodically. And those original Africoid people, uh, spawned by a black mother on the continent that some people have dubbed Eve, begin to transform themselves physically because your environment is different. Instead of the equatorial environment that you would have encountered in Africa that would have molded your physical type, you would, uh, because of these ice age conditions, you would probably have to retreat, in many cases, into the caves of Europe 
And so your pigment will become much uh, lessened. You become much lighter. I think there's a relationship, too, between vitamin D. I don't pretend to be a biologist. Um, your nose will probably go thinner and longer so that you're not breathing in that cold Arctic air that would freeze your lungs. I would guess the hair on your body would even begin to grow differently and maybe grow longer to cover you like a mat. And it's things like this that produce the variations <coughs> in what are called the human race. There's only one race, the human race. But what's the black type is the oldest and most original. There's no doubt about that. Now, I hadn't planned to say any of that. <laughs> but it seemed like a good way to get started. Because tonight we are going to focus uh, largely on the Moors. And the Moors, of course, are most distinguished uh, because of what has been labeled here their conquest of Europe. And that's what we're going to put the bulk of our attention to. Um, by the way, I was talking to my good friend, Paris Williams, a moment or two ago, and she had not seen this flyer before. Uh, did most of you get a copy of this? If you didn't get a copy, you should ask the brothers and sisters in Aztec forward. This is a classic flyer. You know, over the last 10 years or so, I've probably given at least three, 400 lectures. And the last few years in particular, I really tend to focus on some of the literature that gets passed out. Sometimes, you know, they don't spell your name right. <laughs> Or there's a, something that's misspelled. This is a magnificent flyer. And this person right here probably personifies the Moors more than any representative that I can think of. And of course, this is the black Saint Maurice. Saint Maurice, for a long time, was the patron saint of the Roman Empire. So, those are the kind of things that we're going to talk about. Is everybody with me so far? All right. Now, I'm going to do uh, probably the first 30 or 40 minutes in the form of a, a lecture. It's a little later than we had anticipated. And then probably about 30 minutes worth of slides, and then hopefully we'll have a chance for uh, some questions and answers. Now, tonight's presentation is on the Moors in antiquity, and much of this research was published in... Thank you. Most of um, this research that I'll be talking about was published in this particular book, The Golden Age of the Moor, uh, which comes out of Rutgers University and, of course, is edited by my friend and colleague, mentor, Ivan Van Sertema, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, who you all know, and whose research we greatly admire. Now, about two and a half years ago, maybe two years ago, Van Sertema began to say, well, Rashidi, let's start planning what the future issues of the Journal of African Civilizations are going to be. And he says, well, and, you know, after we talked for about an hour, he called me back the next day and he says, well, forget all that. Let's do a book on the Moors. And I didn't think that there was enough material available from an African-centric perspective to really do a comprehensive book on the Moors. In fact, the only major piece that I could think of, which was certainly not African-centered or African-centric, um, was the work by Stanley Lane Poole which is, I think, called The Story of the Moors in Spain. It was originally published in the, I think, 1887, and it was reprinted in uh, about 1990 with a new foreword or preface by the great African-centric scholar uh, John G. Jackson in Chicago. But we began to assemble this information, and we were able to, um, as an assistant editor, I say we, with the Journal of African Civilizations, we begin to accumulate more than enough information. And so it's a lot of that that I'm going to be talking about tonight. In fact, um, James Brunson and I, probably my closest research associate and somebody who has done magnificent work, we were able to put together enough information and in an impressive enough fashion so that it in fact became the first chapter in the book. And in addition to that, I also had an opportunity to as an emissary, you might say, for the Journal of African Civilizations to go to Chicago and go to a nursing home at 3311 South Michigan Avenue and do an interview with John T. Jackson, you know, who is in very poor health. So that is a, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. It's very important to say those things. It's very important to acknowledge ASCAC and those people who are working to put these things together. It's very important to acknowledge the people who are involved in the struggle 
on many different levels. Now I'm get involved in the research because it is important to point out that this is a collective effort, that we all have a responsibility to pursue this and to implement it. Thought, and Kwame, and Kwame used to say that thought without it, practice is empty, and I think action without thought is blind. That we have to become scholar activists, okay, and that all of us play a very important role in that. The, our ancient kinetic ancestors used to say ignorance is evil. And we hear me say ignorance is bliss. Don't, don't tell me I don't want to know. Why? Because with knowledge comes responsibility. Not just me, not Paris, not Manu Ampen, not Brother Naeem, but all of us have a responsibility to take this information and disseminate it. We are not ego tripping. We are not talking about getting lost in the past. We are talking about reconstructing the past. We're talking about rewriting, <clears throat> not African history, because African history is just the missing pages in world history. We're talking about rewriting history from the very beginning. And in order to rewrite history, or the purpose of rewriting history and reconstructing the past, is so that we can construct the future. If you are not familiar with your past, if you lose the past, your, your future becomes a brittle thing, easily broken, says the Chinese proverb. And that is essentially what we're talking about. We are not talking about ego tripping or self-glorification, although rebuilding our self-esteem is very critical. But we're talking about looking into the past, going over the whole book, looking at the role of people of color, especially black folks, looking at the role of women who have been systematically written out of the history book, so that it in fact becomes his story. Or as Napoleon Bonaparte said, a fable agreed upon. And that includes Kenneth, of course, the Nile Valley is a centerpiece. And then we look and see how African civilization or monumental high cultures, by which I mean uh, scripts or written languages, um, agricultural science, that we have the ability to feed ourselves. This develops first in Africa. And isn't it ironic when you look at the Sudan and Somalia? You know that there are some parts of Somalia where there are no children? All the children are dead. And this is where agricultural science originated. A key element of civilization, we've lost that to a significant extent. Other aspects of monumental high culture would be metallurgy, metal weapons and tools. Um, agricultural science and urbanization, that people live in villages, towns, and cities. This is what I mean, these are the rudimentary elements of civilization. And they develop in the Nile Valley to a large extent and they begin to spread to other parts of Africa. And we would want to trace and document that spread into Asia and trace the uh, spread of African civilization in the Tigris Euphrates River Valley, in the Yangtze Valley in China, along the Indus River Valley in South Asia, and then begin to show how that same civilization even diffused into Europe to be able to talk about how the first civilization in Europe is not Greece at all but it's actually a civilization in the Aegean Sea that we call Minoan Crete. And the people of Minoan Crete apparently were refugees, Africans coming from Libya and also northern Africa. And they dominated the Mediterranean and southern Europe for a long time before anybody ever heard of a Greece or a Hellas. To even be able to talk about that influence in terms of Rome, etc., an African element there, and then certainly to be able to trace the influence and the spread and presence of African people in the Americas before Colombo, okay? before 1492. Some people would say before Christ. I simply say before the Christian era. But of course, another very important element that we need to look at too, particularly because uh, of its impact on modern civilization, and that is the Moors. But before we get to the Moors question in Europe, or the Moors presence in Europe, let's look at the Moors historically. Now the first time we hear about a people called the Moors, as far as I know, based on my limited research, is around the 4th century BCE. Um, more or less about that period of time. And they are mentioned as a people in North Africa. And I think generally the term is not Moor, but it's a term of which more is a derivative of, but that term would be Maros or Mali. I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but you spell it. Mali would be spelled M-A-U-R-E. And I think Maros is M-A-U-R-O-S. And that term means scorched. Okay. 
And this applies to a particular group of people in uh, Northwest Africa. We find them, the people known as the Moors or Moros, Mores, if you want documentation for that, by the way, perhaps the best book that covers, um, um, shows what the ancient, how the ancients applied that term, is um, a book by a very confused brother, a brilliant scholar, but a confused African, <laughs> and that is Frank Snowden, the author of this book, um, Blacks in Antiquity, the Greco-Roman Experience. Now, they are mentioned specifically as militarists, and eventually we are to find them fighting with the Carthaginians, or the people of Carthadas, and I'll illustrate that when I begin to get to the slides. Now, Carthadas, or Carthage, the term Carthadas means new town, was founded in 814 years before the Christian era in northern Africa, in parts of the country that today we would call Algeria and Tunisia. It, um, over a period of time, becomes a vast commercial empire. It was founded by a group of people that we call the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians are, after the people of Minoan and Crete, they become the great sea lords of antiquity. And their fleets, their merchant fleets, dominate the Middle Sea, or what we call the Mediterranean Sea, what the people of Kemet or Egypt call the Great Green. Eventually, from a city called Tyre, T-Y-R-E, in 814 B.C.E., these people moved to North Africa. They were largely heavily black folks, by our definitions today. And they blend in with the indigenous North African population, and that produces the empire or the city, um, the nation of Carthage. Now, the Carthaginians are in the western Mediterranean. By the way, the term Phoenician, that's where we derive the word phonics from because the Phoenicians are supposed are credited with introducing the first kind of international alphabet. Okay. And they are the brothers of the, the coastal branch of the people that we call the Canaanites, who of course in the book of Genesis and the Bible are identified as uh, one of the four sons of Ham, the brother of Ethiopia or Cush. Ethiopia is another Greek word which simply means the land of the burnt faced people. In the Bible, the Hebrews would refer to them as the Cushites. And of course, the other brothers of Ham would be uh, Foot, which is identified with Libya sometimes, and Somalia at other times, and then of course Mishraim or Kemet. So you have the Canaanites and the Phoenicians are a coastal branch of the Canaanites. I'm not, well, okay, all right. A coastal branch of the Canaanites. So they move into Northwest Africa. They begin to blend in the small colony um, with the indigenous Northwest African population. and they produced the Empire of Carthage. The Carthaginians uh, developed their empire, but over a period of time, shortly thereafter, the new rising power, the new boy on the block, becomes the Roman Empire. And Rome and Carthage are not far from each other, and they begin to become very competitive with the Romans seizing the initiative and beginning to try to push the Carthaginians um, out of their um, position of dominance, which they eventually do in three massive wars called the Punic Wars. Punic coming from Phoenix or Phoenix or Phoenician. By the way, the term Phoenix um, is apparently a Greek word and apparently means something like ruddy or reddish. We assume they were talking about the complexion of the people. Um, the Moors are fighting with the Carthaginians against the Romans. And apparently they're great warriors. Most of them form a kind of a cavalry. Um, Hannibal Barca, the most distinguished of all the Carthaginians that we know of, lost his only major battle in Europe when his Moorish allies were no longer there in support. By the way, the family of Hannibal Barca were known as the Lion's Brood. These were some rough Africans. And they swore undying hatred to the Roman Empire because the Romans were trying to wipe them out. In fact, supposedly when Hannibal was like 9 or 13, <laughs> he swore undying hatred to the Roman Empire. Reminds me of a Native American that we call Crazy Horse, the Lala brother. When Hannibal was about 21, he was sworn in, uh, he was voted commander-in-chief of the Carthaginian military. And they fought the Romans tooth and nail for a long time. And Hannibal succeeded in um, 
achieving one great victory after the other. But eventually, through massive manpower, largely on the part of the Romans, they were defeated. The Romans came in with two generals uh, who planned the ultimate defeat of uh, Hannibal, by the way, and the name, interestingly enough, was Scipio Africanus. Now, I'm not sure if they were, and by the way, that should tell you that the name of Africa does not come from Leo Africanus. Some people have asked that, because the Romans are using that name at least a thousand years before Leo Africanus. Um, I'm not saying that they were African. It could be that they got the name because of their conquest of Africa. But certainly that is interesting, and for people looking for research projects, that might be one of them. I know, I've not seen anybody do any work on Scipio Africanus, this great, great general who eventually defeated the uh, Carthaginians. How did he do that? Because he said we couldn't defeat Hannibal in Rome, or at the, outskirts, at the outskirts of Rome, we have to go to Africa. And they cut off Hannibal's um, supply. They divided the Africans amongst themselves. For me, a story, isn't it? You have one group of Africans called the Numidians, along with the Moors and the Carthaginians who are fighting together. And Scipio Africanus is able to place a wedge between these forces and fragments them, and they're defeated. It happens every time. By the way, Numidian, that's where we get the word nomad from. And these are North African um, horse soldiers. Eventually, with the fall of Carthage, Rome becomes a dominant power in North Africa. And yet, the, um, the Carthaginians, I should say the Moors, continue to play a very important role. Now, one of the things, I was reviewing a lot of documents to prepare for this lecture. And one of the most interesting things I came across was an article once again sent to me by James Brunson. And um, you have many, many Moors who fought after the Carthaginians fell. The Moors switched their allegiance, and as mercenaries, they began to fight with the Romans. Okay? Now, after a tour of duty of about 25 years, you became a Roman citizen automatically, and you are settled in a particular part of the Roman Empire. Some people might be settled in Germany. Some people might be settled in an area called Gaul. But interestingly enough, you have a lot of these Africans who are settled in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yeah, now this is from a publication called Croatia Land, People, and Culture edited by somebody named Francis H. Eterovich. And in the section beginning on page 383, <laughs> he has a section called A Roman Colonization of Moors in the Balkans and in other regions of Europe. Let me just read a bit of this. Most of the Serbs living in Bosnia and Herzegovina today have a strikingly dark complexion. This was published in 1970. Inherited from the Balkan Vlachs, he spells it V-L-A-C-H-A-S, of the Middle Ages, all historians agree that the Vlachs were not ethnically Slavic. In the Middle Ages, they spoke their own language, derived in large part from Latin. Historians disagree, however, on how they came into possession of their dark brownish complexions, or rather, on which black or semi-black race these Vlachs descended from. It says, in my own study, which is called The Origin of the Vlachs, V-L-A-C-H-S, published in 1956, I have proved that the medieval Vlachs were the descendants of Moors who lived in Mauritania in northwest Africa. As war veterans, they were sold by the Romans along the Danube and the Balkans and in other regions in Europe. It goes on to say that the Roman army was composed of mercenaries who for the most part came from Dalmatia, Gaul, and Mauritania. And then last but not least, he says that the Moors in the Balkans, um, he says that Moors were sold in the Balkans during the reign of the Emperor Claudius and continued to do so until the, the fall of the Western Roman Empire in AD 476. He says, from this document, we may deduce that at the beginning of the 5th century, at least 100,000 descendants of Moors lived in the area which is the present-day Balkans. Writing about the settlement of the Bulgarians in AD 681, the old Croatian chronicles mention the mob blacks under the name of the Black Latins. The black people will be in the thick of it everywhere you find them. Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, 
you. Um, next, I think I'd like to mention briefly the fact that the Moors are very significant. They are once again are in North Africa, and they distinguish themselves again, once again as militarists, although they are to eventually lose this battle. And this is the battle for the control of Northwest Africa as the Arabs begin to invade the continent. Now, and I will talk quite a bit about the African presence in Arabia before this is over, but let me just say that beginning, I think, in 639 or 640, the Arabs, under the banner of Islam, march into Egypt, and they quickly conquer uh, Egypt, which is very momentous. Um, I believe that the man who was in command of the Arab army was a black man, and the man who gave the keys of surrender to Alexandria was also black. So Egypt is defeated very quickly, and rapidly, in the 7th century, the um, Arab armies proceed across northern Africa. They move through Libya very quickly. And eventually, they get to the countries that we would call uh, Mauritania, but mostly Algeria. And there, they are met with the fiercest resistance they are to encounter in all of North Africa. And this is in the 7th century, and this resistance is led by an African woman, interestingly enough, a woman who is called El Kahina, which means the prophetess. We don't know much about this sister, but the descriptions that I get of her seem to indicate that she had dreadlocks and very dark skin. And she is regarded as a prophetess. She apparently would go into um, a kind of a spell, and she was able to really inspire her troops you know, into fierce, fierce resistance. It is said, in fact, that she engaged in a scorched earth policy and kept the Arabs at bay for a long, long time. Unfortunately, over a period of time, uh, her army fragmented, and the Arabs under Musa, <coughs> under a man named Musa, eventually conquered this part of uh, Africa. And according to John Henry Clark, who will be here, I think, on December the 11th or 12th, somebody that you really ought to see, one of our great master griots, master historians, and somebody I consider a real mentor, um, he says that this is the most dust ended the most desperate, the fiercest resistance in known re in antiquity at that time to keep Africa for the Africans, and this is led by a woman. The women are to play very important roles in Moorish history, not only in terms of their conquest of Europe, but also in Africa itself. There's another record of a Moorish, a black Moorish woman written in um, an ancient document that portray portrays her as the head of a group of so-called Amazons and she was supposed to be the greatest archer of her time. You know, I really want to emphasize, once again, the role or uh, the fact that we are in this together. And when we're looking at history, not only are we amazed by how much African history, how much the history of black folks is left out, but specifically the role of African women. And no matter where we find them, that role is very significant. Now, Let's deal directly with the African movement into Europe itself, or the movement of the Moors. The first time we find the Moors moving into Europe after uh, Hannibal and, uh, as an independent movement is around 170 A.D. And apparently they make a small uh, excursion into the country that today we would call Spain. But certainly they make their biggest impact after the fall of Kahina. And some accounts say that uh, she was beheaded and her sons um, converted to Islam. I don't know how accurate that is. But the Moors uh, convert to Islam. They join the triumphs, triumphant surge of Islam and they quickly cross into the Iberian Peninsula where their uh, remarkable feats and swift victories soon became the substance of legends. Now the first probe into Iberia, and if I use three or four terms, I try to be consistent, but I may use Iberia, and if I use Iberia or the Iberian Peninsula, I'm talking, it's too bad we don't have a map. We should have had a map. Um, then we'll be talking about Spain and Portugal. Sometimes it is referred to as Al Andalus. That is an Arabic term that applies to that same area. 
Sometimes uh, Europeans might call it Andalusia, or we might simply use the word Spain and Portugal. The first probe into that part of Europe during the Islamic phase of Moorish history begins on August 17, and it is led by a man known as Tarif, T-A-R-I-F. He leads 400 men into uh, Iberia, into Spain, on a mere reconnaissance mission. Uh, apparently, I think there were like 300 horsemen and 100 infantry. They have a successful reconnaissance. Their idea is to just go and have a probe to see what kind of fighting forces, to see what the political conditions are in Spain for possible conquest, or at least a major raid. Apparently, he was successful and uh, a small city or port is named after him, that is Tarifa, T-A-R-I-F-A, and that's where we get the word Tara from, from this African, a Moor. But the major movement is to come sometime in the next year, and that is, of course, led by the great General Tariq, T-A-R-I-K. Tariq is to become a known as the first great general of Western Islam the sword arm of Islam. This is a great, great warrior. We don't know a lot about him. Musa, this Arab governor of Northwest Africa, or the Arab who commanded the conquest of Northwest Africa, makes um, Tariq the governor of much of what we call Mauritania. And I think in June, June or July 7-11, they cross the straits, once again, the narrow strip of water that separates uh, Africa from Europe and they stop on a rocky promontory that uh, from that day since has brought his name, and that is Gibraltar, or what we call Gibraltar. Now let's get an African. Now Dr. Joseph A. A. Ben Yachinen, who has done uh, significant studies on the Moors, even tells me that the man who led the uh, movement across the water, who actually brought the Africans across the Snell Strip, was known as Admir. And he says this is where we get the Spanish word admiral from. All of this is in the 8th century. These are black men, Muslims, imbued with a degree of um, almost religious fanaticism. Where they are determined to spread the teachings of Islam. Now, um, Tariq had a relatively small force. How am I doing so far? Everything okay? Um, I'm kind of quiet out there. I took my glasses off. I can hardly see. I'm hoping everything is going good. <laughs> but I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm glad we have a turnout. All right? <laughs> um, Tariq leads 10,000 men across the, the straits of Gibraltar. And uh, mostly they're Berber. We're going to deal with the word Berber in a little while. They're mostly Arab. Um, not Arab, forgive me, I'm really tripping now. you got a few Arabs, and that kind of shows the confusion too, because the Greeks and the Romans called these people Moors or Moros. The Arabs called them Berbers. And then when they get to Europe, the um, Spanish, the white Spanish Christians will call them either Moors or Saracens. Okay, and then you have more civilization, which is a composite of all of that, and that is why the Moors are confusing. I, when I was giving the introduction, and I was going around the world, and I talked about the various civilizations, it is important to look at the Moors because they are in many ways like the Egyptians were perhaps 50 years ago, before a lot of our attention was focused on them, and people were able to claim that there was a mythical white Egyptian race. You know, ain't no such thing as a white Egyptian in antiquity. That's a myth. Uh, you can show me one, bring him here. Right? Well, the Moors are similar to that. Right? We haven't really looked at the Moors critically. In fact, most people really don't acknowledge the Moors at all, probably for two reasons. First, because they were black to a large extent, and secondly, because this most recent phase of Western civilization, with a caveat and quotation marks and brackets underlined in bold face, Western civilization, somebody asked behind this Gandhi once, what do you think of Western civilization? And Gandhi found it for a minute and he says, you know, I think it would be a very good idea. Um, because they were, they were black and also because they were Muslims. 
and the people who conquered them being Christian and white, you know, I think automatically put them into the closet, put them on a back burner. So it's important to look at them again. Now, um, but it's confusing. And we have to uh, dis- do a lot of deciphering. And we have to do a lot of research to really get to the core. As Manu Oppen would say, primary research. Now, we're in Spain with Tariq in July 7-11. And he has a force of about 10,000 Moors and maybe three or 400 Arab propagandists, it is said. And he is confronting an army led by a man known as King Roderick. Roderick was the last king of the Visigoths. And the Visigoths was the ruling white Spanish Christian uh, element that was in power at that time. Remember now, Spain has been, um, it's a very ancient land obviously, geographically. You have many people that have been there. You have African movements into Spain going back as far as a thousand years before the Christian era. And you have an expedition led by the great Tal- um, Taharka of the 25th Kushite Nubian or Kemetic dynasty. And then you have more of the go there in 170. You have the movements of Hannibal. In fact, some people would say that Hannibal's father <coughs> um, I remember the Barker family. I said this is a suggestion now. I'm not saying the fact that I actually even founded the city of Barcelona. And then you have Roman movements. You have other white people who come through. Right? So you have kind of a hodgepodge. So um, Roderick is leading the white, largely white Spanish Christian army, although we will even show you black people in that army that were fighting against the black Moors, black Spanish Christians fighting against the Moors. Leads an army of 70,000 men, a massive army, and Tariq has 10,000 men, perhaps 10,500. And supposedly uh, a great battle is to be joined. And Tariq is the list to arouse his troops, more or less with the following words, my brothers. And this is quoted by Edward Gibbon in the book, um, the three volume set, the masterwork in the 18th century, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, or the rise and the of the Roman Empire. He says, my brothers, the enemy is before you, the sea is behind you. There's nowhere to run. Follow your general, for I am determined to achieve victory and to trample on the prostrate king, the prostrate body of the Roman Empire, of the Roman Emperor. And they jacked the Visigoths up. Uh, This was a paramount victory over 70,000 troops. Tariq must have been awesome. And he didn't sit to relish his victory. He raced on with a seemingly uh, tireless Berber or Moorish cavalry to the city of Toledo, conquered that, where he was joined by Musa. And together they uh, conquered the rest of, most of the rest of the Iberian Peninsula, only stopping in southern France at a place called Tours, T-O-U-R-S. If not for that, then perhaps all of Europe would have been Islamic today. They were stopped in 732 by a man that we know as uh, Charles Martel or Charles the Hammer. This is the grandfather of Carolingian uh, dynasty's uh, finest representative, and that is Charlemagne, who we'll return to shortly. Now, once uh, the initial Moorish conquest had been achieved, you have a movement of so-called Arabs into Spain led by Musa. And once again, Musa is the head. Mm, I'm going to pick it up. Musa is the head of the Arab armies that uh, had ordered the conquest of Northwest Africa. Now, although the Africans had achieved the greatest victories, they were given the least rewards. They were given the worst allotments of land, and they were treated, no, no doubt about it, in a second-class manner. Tariq himself is reputed is reported to have been publicly rebuked and is struck by a whip by Musa. The head of the Islamic world heard about it and called both of them to a meeting in Damascus where um, it was Musa who was publicly rebuked and humiliated. All his money was taken away from him and I think he was forced to live as a penniless beggar the rest of his life. Whereas Tariq, at the conclusion of of an illustrious military career, uh, went to the Far East, we are told, to spread the teachings of Islam. Tariq should be the subject of a a book. We should know about who this great African general was. Now, after 
the conquest, the initial conquest of the Iberian Peninsula, Moors by the thousands flooded over. In fact, some are said, have said, are said to have been so anxious to get there <laughs> that they are said to have floated over on tree trunks. And brothers were trying to get there. And so you have a fundamental, a massive movement of black people into Spain as Muslims beginning in the 8th century. In the 10th century, the movement intensifies. You have the first dynasty, which is called the Umayyad dynasty. And then they are followed by the, uh, another dynasty into Spain, two other black dynasties, the Almoravids, led by Yusuf I, who was from Senegal. You know, that's how far the Moorish Empire extended. And Yusuf, by the way, is described as being brown, still with woolly hair. His empire, the Almoravid Empire, is so large that it extends from the Senegal River in Africa all the way to the River Ebro in Spain. And it is called the Empire of the Two Shores. Uh, Yusuf reminds me of Pianchi, or Pi in the Nile Valley. He's a very pious man. He does not come to conquer. He comes at the invitation of the Moorish princes in Spain who are squabbling amongst themselves and allowing the white Spanish Christians to begin to exert so much pressure that they cannot maintain themselves. And, and so Yusuf is invited to come over uh, in the name of Islam and more solidarity to come and once again keep the white Spanish Christians at bay, which he does. Uh, and as soon as he leaves, the Moorish princes begin to squabble amongst themselves again, and they eventually, a few years later, ask him to come again. He says, all right, now. And in fact, he comes. <clears throat> and then the same thing happens again. This time he comes as a conqueror. And he establishes what's called the Almoravid dynasty. And then, about 50 years later, 100 years later, you have the last great dynasty, and that is called the Almohad dynasty, Almohad. A-L, Almoravid is spelled A-L-M-O-R-A-V-I-D, and Almohad, A-L-M-O, I see, A-L-M-O-H-A-D-E-S. And then there's one more, eventually a minor dynasty, an African dynasty called the Marinid dynasty, M-A-R-I-D. Now, the Moors, one of the problems with, with the Moors' occupation in Spain is that they do not leave a lot of visual representations. Uh, perhaps because of religious beliefs at that time, they did not believe, um, 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 I think this is accurate, they did not believe in portraying what the human form, and as a result of that, most of the depictions that we have in the Moors is that of, of their enemies, the white Spanish Christians, who refer to them consistently in many documents as black. Black is a cooking pot, black is tar, black is pitch. They refer to them as the cold-faced ones to the extent that the word more, uh, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, the Moors as early as the Middle Ages and as late as the 17th century were commonly supposed to be black or very swarthy, and hence the word was often used for Negro. So by the 16th century, in fact, you know that's inaccurate. I'm reading that directly from the encyclopedia, because at that time there was no such thing as a Negro. Uh, but it was often used for a black person. You see what I'm saying? Now, I've been studying this for 20 years. <laughs> and I'm caught up in it. We all have a white supremacist, a Klan member, walking around in our head. <laughs> because he's been planted there. And, the field, and white supremacy extends into academia, it extends into all governmental and state institutions. And we have to wipe that out. You know, as long as I've been studying this, and I begin to digress for a moment to try to make it real. Uh, I began to pursue this about 1972, very actively. And since about 1981, this is like all I do. I quit my job, you know, I stay at home most of the time in front of a computer. Parents will tell you it's hard to get me out studying. And when I'm not doing that, I'm lecturing, I'm out traveling, trying to get some information. Do you know all the books, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of books that I've referenced, it was only a few years ago that I could see black people in my mind as the Egyptians. Nef I could see Nefertiti up there. I could see Cleopatra. That's how deeply entrenched this is. We say all the time that, that we have to begin to do this for the children, to put it in the schools. 
But we also need a cadre of old folks who have this information that can take it and walk with it. Okay? And the Moors are a very key component in that. Now, other people have not had, let me just present some information in terms of the Moors and the black thing. Let me quote a couple people. It says, for example, during the European Renaissance, explorers, writers, and scholars began to apply the word Oh, trip. During the European Renaissance, explorers, writers, and scholars begin to apply the term more to blacks in general. A prominent example of this tendency can be found in the work of Richard Hakluyt, H-A-K-L-U-Y-T. This is a prominent 15th century traveler. Hakluyt recorded that in old times, the people of Africa were called Ethiops and Negritos, or Negriti which we now call Moors, Moors, and Negroes. In the Roma Romance languages, Spanish, French, and Italian, the first time I uh, read that, it bothered me because I had heard of the Romance languages. And I thought the Romance languages, you know, meant amore and love. That just means the, uh, Rom the language of the Romans. In the Romance language of Spanish, French, and Italian of medieval Europe, more was translated as more, wa, and more. Derivatives of the word more may be found even today in these same languages. <coughs> in Spanish, for example, the word for blackberry is mora, a noun which originally meant Moorish woman. Also in Spanish, the ad adjective for dark complexion, which now means brunette, is moreno. We have a similar legacy in the French language. In French, more card means dark skin or black or more. While Marillion means black, while Marillion means black grape. Again, as in the Spanish, the Italian word more means Negro or more is female. Also in Italian, more means blackberry, while more Ola means black olive. So there should be no doubt about what the, you know who the Moors were. Shakespeare used the word more and African interchangeably. And by once again by the 13th or 14th century. The word more was more or less a synonym for um, African or black. Now, two of the Moors that are perhaps the most outstanding representations for their influence on Europe, two individuals, would be St. Maurice and Sir Morian. Now, St. Maurice uh, is also known as the Knight of the Holy Lands, and Maurice in a nutshell, just to briefly talk about a story and not to read, Maurice uh, is identified in a document by a guy named Eucarius, who is the Bishop of Lyon, I think around 450, uh, 450 years into the Christian era. And he points out that Maurice was a duke or a count who lived in the Thebaid region of Egypt. This is the center of Egypt, and that at this point, this was a strong point for Christianity. And he was a commander of a legion of uh, African soldiers who were under the influence of Rome, and they amounted to 6,600 men. And they were ordered to a place uh, that the Romans called Gaul, which would, have, which would have incorporated parts of Switzerland and Germany, and they were sent there to suppress an uprising of these rebellious Roman subjects. Now when Maurice gets there, he finds out that these people that are involved in the uprising are also Christian. And he decides that he cannot fight fellow Christians. Now, he refuses his orders. He refuses to obey the commands of the Roman emperor, who I think was Maximian at that time. And Maximian, when he hears about this, is furious. And he goes directly to the spot, and he orders, personally, uh, Maurice to uh, suppress the uprising, which Maurice once again refuses. So he begins to have 10 men at a time, all in the Theban region, beheaded, thinking that this will eventually pressure Maurice to obey the orders, and he does not. Eventually, Maurice himself is beheaded refusing to uh, renounce his religion, to obey his orders, and to um, worship the gods of the Romans, whoever they may have been at that time. Now, about a hundred years later, Maurice becomes a martyr. 
and uh, the cult of St. Maurice begins to spread throughout Western and Central Europe, along the Rhine, in France, you know, in Burgundy, in various parts of Germany. By the 8th century, and by the time that the Moors are moving into Spain, the cult of St. Maurice is reaching immense proportions. I told you about Char I mentioned Charlemagne, who was a grandson of Charles Martel. Charlemagne is from a dynasty called the Carolingian dynasty. And he is probably most, the most important European of his time. He carried the lance of St. Maurice into battle. He had the lance of St. Maurice, which was uh, regarded, which was supposed to be a replica, believed to be a replica of the lance that pierced the side of Christ identified with this black military saint carried before the lands, carried before uh, the army. In addition to that, Maurice has a banner, a special banner. This banner is so important that whenever the uh, Central Europeans, like the Germans, go into battle in the East against the Slavs, they carry the banner of St. Maurice before the army. St. Maurice, beginning, it is said, and this I find remarkable, it was not until 1240 A.D., that Maurice is identified as, or portrayed as black, which is very odd to me because the name Maurice means like a moor. And moor literally is, is black. To be moor is meant to be black. But by this time, you have Maurice clearly identified as a black person. In fact, I think this is one of the first and earliest distinct images of Maurice. I don't have this on a slide, so let me just talk about this briefly. This piece right here, was constructed in the year 1240 in a cathedral in a place called Magdeburg, Germany. And what it shows is a black man, a knight, a clear and distinct black knight in a full suit of armor, life size, with red lips, black skin, etc. This is not a figment of, of anybody's imagination. This is a real live person. And for about the next three to four hundred years, Maurice is to become the dominant patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire, a black saint. By the, 12th, by the 14th century, his um, cult was rivaled only by St. Michael and St. George. And even today, in parts of Eastern Europe, the cult of St. Maurice is still alive. This is a black saint. In the 14th century, you even have a... Um, you even have a cathedral built to St. Maurice in Lithuania. And you can still, I'm told, go there and see the evidence of this cathedral, which is surrounded by the heads of what is called Blackamoors. You also have Sir Morian. Most people have probably not heard of Sir Morian. Sir Morian is, in fact, a black knight who is the second, after Maurice, the second dominant Moors figure in medieval Christendom. Now, once again, the Moors distinguish themselves largely as Muslims, but the Moors are, but um, they're not a religious group, it's an ethnic group. And some of them become Christians. And some of them are Christians and Muslims all at the same time. Some elements are Christians, some are Muslim, etc. Now, Sir Morian is probably a Christian convert who comes from Spain. And this is documented in a book simply called Morian, M-O-R-I-E-N, which is a metrical romance. It was originally written in French and later in Dutch. And it was translated in 1901 by a guy named Jesse L. Weston. I don't know the publishing house. Uh, Morian is a metrical romance, and it's the, splendid, it's the adventure of a splendidly heroic um, European knight. And to hear the story, well, as the story goes, as it begins, it involves the Knights of the Round Table. And Morian, who is gigantic, rides up on a huge horse, and he's cut up, and he's bloody, and he's about to fall off the horse. And he rides up, and there are the Knights of the Round Table. It's like a boys' club, hanging out, right? And Sir Gawain, Sir Lancelot, whoever the rest of them were. Um, Galahad. And here's this great black knight, and he's all cut up, and they, you know, he falls off his horse, and they ask him to tell his story. Who are you, brother? How'd you get here? Tell him what's the deal. You know, we want to hear about it. At any rate, not in those exact words, but to paraphrase it, that's what they were more or less asking the brother. 
So anyway, Mary is on a quest. And apparently what had happened was his father, before Mary was born, was on his way to the Crusades. And on the way, he met and fell in love with Marion's mother, got her pregnant, and then left. Right? Now, Marion's mother was disgraced as a result of that. And as when Marion became of age, he was looking for his father. One of the few explanations. Like, why haven't we seen you? And now that you're, I want to hear the story, and I want you to come back with me, explain it to my mother, her family, and then everybody else in the city. Because my mother has lived under this cloud. This is in the story. So he's on a quest to find his father, which he eventually does. <clears throat> and he forces him to go back. He's all apologies. He says, hey, man, one of those things. <laughs> so he takes it. He, once again, he didn't use those exact words. But in the interest of time, he takes him back. And he explains. And in the process, Morgan meets all the knights at the round table and becomes, um, becomes um, the ultimate, <laughs> the personification of uh, Christian knighthood. He becomes the finest knight in Europe. He saves Sir Gawain's life. He's articulate and he's consistently described as black. Black as pitch. <laughs> black as ink. The only thing white about him was his teeth. Black as a crow. And this is Sir Moria. Now, when we hear about black knights, we tend to think that's a myth. But you do have very, very important figures in terms of Christianity with the black St. Maurice. There's a book with that same title, The Black St. Maurice. You can find him in this book, other book, The Image of the Black and Western Art, Volume 2. They have magnificent photographs, full color photographs of a clear and distinct black saint. And then you also have Sir Morgan. Now, Sir Morgan, the fact that he impacts with the Knights of the Round Table, which is supposed to be in merry old England, once again begins to show the diffusion of the Moors, the diffusion of African people, and this is the key thing, not as slaves, but as masters in control of his and her own destinies. Though I always never failed to say that the one thing that really propelled me, that really made me want to look at antiquity, and to call myself, if I can, a historian, which I have worked very, di very diligently at for many years now, is the fact that I found out with something which may be very simple to you, something you might take for granted, it was certainly nothing that I took for granted, is that we actually went places in ancient times without shackles and chains. I couldn't believe that. Because I had grown up with the notion that African history began in a remote African jungle, or began in a cotton patch in Kentucky. Right? That we had no history of noble stature that was independent in and of European. As though we waited in a dark room for a white person to come into that room and turn on the light. And nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it took a while. <laughs> in fact, if anything, just the opposite of that were the case. But that is not the way history is generally taught in the Western world. In the Americas, we are taught that history begins largely, and I'm not speaking generally, and we are oversimplifying things. But sometimes you have to do that. We are also talking about another kind of scholarship. We're talking about approaching history in another light. I think that our history is generally uh, perceived to begin with Christopher Columbus and the catastrophe, the Holocaust that he unleashed in the Western Hemisphere with Pizarro and Cortez and the rest of those boys, Barbora. And then in the East, quite often we would look and we would begin our real, real analysis of history with Marco Polo in China. And of course, in Africa, it would begin with the Greeks, particularly with Alexander, Alexander the Greek. Uh, Alexander, by the way, who was fascinated by Africa, uh, who had great respect from all I could gather, and I have no reason to defend him, <laughs> who had great respect for Africa to the extent that he requested that he be buried in Africa. Usually when you die, you want your body sent back home. But even in uh, Vietnam, talking about getting the remains of POWs, you want your remains back home. Alexander wanted to be buried in Africa, and in fact, he eventually was. Um, 
By the way, it is said that so many Greek scholars studied in Africa, particularly Egypt. I think it was Demosthenes or Democritus who was supposed to have said, if I had a book of a thousand pages, I would not have room to write the names of all the Greek scholars who studied in Africa. It is so, um, our image now has been just the reverse of that, that history begins in fact with white folks somewhere. And it couldn't begin with people of color anywhere. Um, so that was really what moved me. And that is, I think, perhaps a key element of what we might call an African-centered perspective, is that we do not dwell on the slave experience. All people have had that experience, but with African people, that is the primary focus. It is said, and I've even been told, there's no point in looking toward the past. You don't have a past except for slavery. Um, of course, uh, that person didn't, uh, probably didn't tell anybody else that. We also, um, Well, I mean, that's typical. You know, uh, there's a book, Doug Naeem and I were talking about it earlier, called What They Didn't Teach You in History Class. And they have a whole stream of quotes about what prominent scholars have had to say about African uh, history, or lack of. Arnold Toynbee, for example, is supposed to have said of all the 21 major civilizations that have been created, the African race has not played a part in any one. <laughs> James Henry Breasted, one of the finest Egyptologists of all time, points out that the African has no inkling of civilization. Uh, as recently as the 1960s and 70s, Hugh Trevor Roper in England, who I think was one of Van Schroeder's instructors, is quoted as saying, a student asked him once, why don't, Professor Roper, why don't we learn the history of black Africa? And he says, because there is no history of black Africa. There is simply none to teach. There's only the history of Europeans in Africa. The rest is darkness, and darkness is not a subject of history. See, he needs to be right there, in the front row. Now, Morian shows the diffusion of not only black people in Europe, but particularly the diffusion of the Moors. By 1492, Christian pressure from the Moors had become irresistible. Now, the Moors dominate southern Spain for close to 800 years. But eventually, more and more and more and more and more over a long period of time, the um, white Spanish Christians began to put pressure on the Moors, and eventually by 1492, they had the last Moors stronghold surrounded. And that is in a place called Cordova, and is specifically uh, in a place called the Alhambra. But before I get to that concluding chapter on the Moors, let me, um, if I may, just read a little bit about the level of Moorish civilization and why they're important. Now, I'm quoting here from John G. Jackson. And he says that the Spanish city of Cordova in the 10th century was very much like a modern city. Its streets were well paved and there were raised sidewalks for pedestrians. At night, one could walk for 10 miles by the light of lamps, flanked by, flanked by an uninterrupted extent of buildings. This was hundreds of years before there was a paved street in Paris, France, or a street light in London, England. The population of Cordova was over a million. There were 200,000 homes, 8,000 public schools, and many colleges and universities. Let me repeat that. There were 200,000 homes, 800 public schools, and many colleges and universities. Cordova possessed 10,000 palaces of the wealthy, besides many royal palaces surrounded by beautiful gardens. There were even 5,000 mills in Cordova at a time when there was not even one in the rest of Europe. There were also 900 public baths besides a, a large number of private ones at a time when the rest of Europe considered bathing as extremely sinful. If you ever go back in a time warp, just skip that. <laughs> at a time when the rest of Europe considered bathing as extremely sinful and to be avoided as much as possible. Cordova was also graced by a system of over 4,000 public markets. He says the great mosque of Cordova, another grand uh, structure, had a scarlet and gold roof with a thousand columns of marble. It was lit by more than 200 silver chandeliers containing more than a thousand silver lamps burning perfumed oil. The golden age 
age of the Umayyad dynasty in Spain came during the 10th century. During the reigns of Abd al-Rahman and Hakam II, the Umayyad dynasty established sovereignty over the most substantial portion of the Iberian Peninsula. At the pinnacle of the Umayyad dynasty, this is somebody else now, the figures confirm Jackson, the great city of Cordova possessed 200,000 residences, 600 mosques, 900 public baths that were patronized by all social classes. Among his many accomplishments, Hakam II added 27 schools for the free instruction of the poor. It should be pointed out that at least during this period of Islamic Spain, girls as well as boys went to school, and numerous Moorish women became prominent in the literary and artistic field. Other Moorish women were involved in education, law, medicine, and library science. By 1492, the Christian pressures on the Moors grew irresistible, and on January 2nd, 1492, the last Moorish stronghold in Spain surrendered. Uh, this was in the Alhambra. And it is said, I was just reading an account a few days ago, that for 23 years, Ferdinand and Isabella, one being the, being the queen and king of Aragon and Castile, had roared and this was the culmination of the war. Finally, I think on the morning of January 2nd, 1492, um, the last Moors surrendered and they were escorted out of the city. And a cheering throng, um, a mob of people cheered as Ferdinand and Isabella moved into the Alhambra. Ferdinand, uh, Christopher Colombo, uh, Christopher Colombo was among that crowd, among the cheering crowd. And within uh, three months, I believe, his expedition had been launched. Now, in January 2nd, 1492, the Moors are defeated in Spain. Three months after that, the Jews are expelled from Spain. And in October 1492, Colombo is discovered in the Caribbean. And that can't be a coincidence. 1492 is to mark a fundamental turning point in world history. And much of it has to do with the final conquest, what these people call the world's longest liberation struggle, isn't that ironic, and their conquest of the Moors in Spain. Now what happened to those Moors? Some of them stayed in Spain for a long time, but they were called Moriscos, or Little Moors. Eventually, by 1600, most of them had been expelled. I think in 1596, by a special decree of 1496, the Moors were expelled from Portugal. Over a million Moors, um, settled in Spain, I'm sorry, in France, where their descendants were to exercise a tremendous impact. Other Moors went into the Netherlands. For example, there's a curious story of a, um, a black man named Swart Piet. Swart Piet is a, this is in the Netherlands, in Holland. You know, Santa Claus, or Santa Claus has an assistant in Holland, and that is Swart Piet, or Black Peter. And by tradition, he supposedly was a Moorish orphan boy, a Moorish orphan boy, who Santa Claus trained and adopted as his assistant. Okay. You also have Moors spreading through the very um, far east of Europe. In the ninth century, for example, the Moors laid siege to the city of Rome. In the farthest extensions, you have a person named Ibrahim Hannibal, he becomes known as the Moor of Peter the Great. And once again, by this time, many black people were known as Moors. And Peter the Great was the greatest czar in Russia during that period of time. Uh, this brother was so intelligent that he was sent to France um, as the godson of Peter the, the Great, or Peter the First. He received the finest education possible at that time. Uh, he received a, a degree in engineering. He became a general in the army. And this is the, ma the great maternal grandfather of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, who is the father of Russian literature. Gorky and Tolstoy say that Pushkin was all things Russian. He was more than the Shakespeare of Russia. And the reason we don't know more about him is because his works, for some reason, do not effectively translate. But in the Soviet Union, or the former Soviet Union, there are literally cities named after Pushkin, and they all identify him as black. Pushkin, when he died at the tender age of 37, defending his wife's honor in a duel, um, was working on a book, in fact, called The Moor of Peter the Great. 
and Pushkin gloried in his African ancestry. The Dumas family did not. The Dumas family, the great Afro-French, in fact, let me just digress for a moment and compare Pushkin, Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, if you want to read an excellent book on him, there's a piece by John Oliver Killings called Great Black Russian. John Oliver Killings is the same person that wrote Sippy and Youngblood. Um, and he gloried in his African ancestry. Pushkin, in fact, was a, is a fascinating figure. Uh, he was born, I think, on May 29, 1799, of well-to-do parents, members of the Russian aristocracy. When he was about 15 years old, he began to write his, his first books. When he was 17 years old, he had published books. And he was a brilliant poet, very swaggering, very arrogant. During his 20s, he was exiled because his literature was considered too revolutionary. And the kind of person that Pushkin was, he really seemed to thrive on attention. He would wear, for example, outlandish outfits. He might have a, a scarlet red turban with a canary yellow uh, scarf and a stunning blue, you know, vest and some white boots on and really would get mad if you noticed him, right? And he would challenge you to a duel. Eventually he, he was defeated like that. But he was brilliant and he was working at the end. Hey, don't ever say anything about him being African. That was enough to get you killed because he was regarded as an expert marksman. So eventually he dies about the age of 38 and he gloried in his Africanness. Now the Dumas family is just the opposite of that. You have first I think it's maybe Thomas Davy Dumas, who was born in Santo Domingo in the 1700s, and he leaves Santo Domingo when he's 18. The next time we see him, when he's 21, he is a major general in the French army. Very big man, and supposedly uh, he was an idol, or Napoleon Bonaparte idolized him. Napoleon Bonaparte seemed to have a thing for, for black. His wife is a black woman, so-called Creole from uh, the Caribbean. And Napoleon loved her to the extent that his dying words were Josephine, Josephine. Gordon right? J. Rogers had 12 black generals in his army. Uh, in 1799 or 1798, he invades Egypt. So his life is surrounded by black folks one way or the other. And the elder Dumas was with uh, Bonaparte in Egypt, by the way. And that is how, why they fell out supposedly because of uh, Napoleon's destruction of Egyptian monuments. His son, Alexander Dumas Perret, uh, is probably the most prolific writer in, in relatively modern times. He supposedly wrote over 600 pieces. The Man in the Iron Mask, The Count of Monte Cristo, The Black Tulip, The Black Corsican, etc. But he didn't seem to acknowledge very much his African ancestry. He did say one thing that was very interesting. He said a man's mind is elevated by the status of the woman that he keeps company with. That is an interesting point. Van Sertima tells me that Dumas is our first known Egyptologist, that he in fact had written a book on Egyptology. And just as another side note, his son, uh, the third Dumas, became the um, president of the French Academy of Sciences. That's three generations. That's deep. This is where slavery is going on. So you have um, Pushkin identifying himself as a Moor. You also have many Moors that venture into England. Uh, the best book on the subject is a work by David McRitchie called Ancient and Modern Britons. It was originally published in 1884. It was reprinted in 1985. It's subsequently been reprinted once or twice again. McRitchie, who was a Scottish anthropologist, born in 1851, died in 1925 seem to have gone crazy with black people in this book. And I wonder what could have possessed him. He writes about black Australians, about black Huns, he writes about black Vikings. I don't know if you are aware of that. I don't know if that's a result of the spread of the Moors, but black Vikings. He talks about black people in Ireland. But the key of the book is the movement of Moors into um, the British Isles in ancient Britain. He talks about the Moorish influence on the music of Britain. By the way, the greatest musicians of that time were Moors, including one known as Zirab, or Z-I-R, I think Y-A-B, who was so bad, he was simply called the Blackbird. This brother was, who, who, who invented the guitar, according to some people, was so significant as a musician that it is said when he was coming that the uh, kings 
or governors or mayors of various cities would go meet him on the road. And he was called the Blackbird. McGritchie talks about the influence of Moors physically and culturally throughout the British Isles. For example, he talks about a man known as Kenneth the Niger, or sometimes known as Kenneth the Moor, a black man who was supposedly the um, head of three provinces in Scotland during the 10th century. And he traces their names. For example, he's able, he, his contention is, if you have a name like Moore or Morris or something to that effect in Britain, then you are somehow anciently connected to one of those movements of black folks that went there. He points out that in various islands in the British Isles, even during the 16th century, people still identified folks as having black skin or very dark skin. And this is something that most of us don't know about. Last but not least, I could possibly mention the fact that you have also what may be a Moorish presence in the traditions of Ireland. Ireland specifically mentions black people, possibly Moors, and they are identified as African sea rovers who raided the northwest, they call the Fomorians, and they raided the northwest coast of Ireland from a place called the Hebrides Islands. And apparently there was a struggle for who was going to actually control Ireland for a long period of time. You may have heard of the Black Irish. So many of these stories may well be connected with the movement of Moors into Spain and Portugal beginning in the 8th century, and then their diffusion and the ultimate spread of those Moors into France, uh, into Germany. For example, Haydn, I think Joseph Haydn, who is the instructor of Beethoven, is usually referred to as the Moor. And according to uh, J. E. Rogers, um, even Beethoven himself is sometimes called a black Moor. You have Moorish people or Moorish families exercising a tremendous influence in the British royal families. For example, we may be able to trace the uh, rise of Charlotte Sophia, who was the grandmother of Victoria, who was the wife of King George when the American Revolution was going on, a black woman, clear and distinct black woman, who the city of Charlotte, North Carolina is named after. So I could go on and on and on. Uh, if you have a name like Maurice, or Morehouse, or Moreway, or Moretti, or Swartz, or Swartz Cough, you are probably directly related somehow or another to those original Moors. And if you think I'm kidding with the term Schwarzkopf, when the Persian Gulf War was going on, somebody brought it to my attention. The name Schwarzkopf means black head. And if you look at J. Rogers' book, Nature Knows No Color Line, you can literally see these family crests from medieval Europe, hundreds of them with black heads. And certainly you have two named Schwarzkopf with the emblem on the family crest being black, the head of a Moor. Somebody might want to write him a letter and tell him that. <laughs> now, as for the main part of my lecture, what I want to do now is try to illustrate some of these things in the form of a slide presentation, um, and we'll go from there. So now we want to turn the lights down, It'll be really informal, it will take maybe a half hour to go through this. Is, is that too dark? I think it might be too dark. All right. How about that? Well, y'all just behave yourselves. Now, um, this, I, I'll, I'll try now to illustrate briefly the Moorish presence in Europe, but I'll try to uh, focus on the African influence in European antiquity in general. Of course, this is the world's oldest known statue, well, the oldest statuette in Europe, and this is called the Venus of Wellendorf. And I want you to take careful note of this piece. This was uh, at one time on display right up here in San Francisco. And I think one of my first trips, or well, not to the Bay Area anyway, um, to Frisco, first research trip, which must have been about 19, I guess 80 or something like that. This piece was on display. Or oh, replica of it. This is called the Venus of Wollendorf. It's only three or four inches high. And I think it's either steel type or soapstone. And this is the oldest known identifiable statuette in Europe. It's approximately 30,000 years old. Now, I want you to look at the hairstyle. Some people would regard this as a fertility figure, an ancient, ancient goddess. 
but that would be a modern goddess right there. This would be a sister from the Andaman Islands. Now, it's my contention, and probably many others as well, this is probably not original. Once again, we're in this thing collectively. A lot of these slides, by the way, I'm going to show you, have been sent to me by people like James Brunson, Elaine Chandler, etc. Pastors submitted a number of things to me, or shared a number of things with me, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and so let me acknowledge that. Um, that you have probably a movement of people out of Africa beginning 100,000 years or so or more and they in physical size would be small black people. People that we would call Batwa or something like that. Pygmies would be the more pejorative term. And they are the first people of the first world. Small black lords of the earth. They spread all over the earth. And that would really be an indication of that. This is a modern depiction of this same African physical type that we find in the Bay Bengal in uh, India, off the coast of India. And this is an ancient piece from Russia. This is about 14,500 years old. Uh, that the fatty uh, excess um, on the buttocks, that's called steatopigia, and obviously that's something that's characterized very much by African people. Now this is Hannibal, or what we think to be Hannibal. The great warrior who led uh, his troops from Northwest Africa into uh, Europe. And uh, of course, among those troops were Moors, who formed a part of the cavalry. This is a Phoenician piece. This would be from the city of which um, the, the uh, Carthaginians came from. Remember now, I told you that Carthage was founded by, from a place called Tyre, the Phoenicians. This would be a Phoenician. And that's a beautiful piece. It looks very comedic in appearance. And that's, you know, probably um, for good reason. Once again, the people of Kenneth and the people of uh, the Phoenicians, the Phoenician city-states were very close as a whole. This is that piece of the Roman emperor. And this is a very rare piece. This is Septimius Severus. He is important because he's the most significant of at least three Roman emperors. He reigns from about 181 to about uh, 197, 199 years after the Christian era. He is the last Roman emperor to die in bed for about 100 years. The rest of them were assassinated. Um, He's directly from Africa. I don't know if he would be a Moor. Eventually he went back to Africa and he engaged in a triumphant homecoming tour. And for documentation of that, the most comprehensive documentation is a book called Septimius Severus, the African Emperor of Rome, by a guy named Anthony Burley, published by Doubleday, I think in 1970 or 1972. It's still in print. And it's not a very good piece. It seems like a light-skinned brother, but certainly there he is nevertheless. Here's another piece from that same period. And here's another one. These are black people that played critical roles in the Roman Empire. Of course, you have three African Roman emperors. You also have three African popes, Victor I, Miltiades, and Galatius. Now, Victor I is on the throne at the same time, uh, not on the throne, but he's the pope. At the same time, it might be the same thing, at the same time that Septimius Severus is a Roman emperor. And you also have a black man, an African named Tertullian at that time, who was the most advanced theologian in the church. He's the one, apparently, who was responsible for Latin being the official language of the church for such a long time. So dig that. Even after the fall of Carthage, even after the fall of Kenneth, you have an African emperor at Rome, you have an African pope, and a leading theologian in, in the world at that time, all Africans. Victor I, by the way, is important. One of his contributions is that he is responsible for making, um, for seeing to it that Easter is celebrated on Sunday every year. These are all black people. Now these are Moorish cavalry. Note the plated hairstyles. These would be typical of the folks that fought in what's called the Dacian Wars and who were settled in Eastern Europe and the Balkan states. This is a Moorish soldier I think this is from the 2nd or 3rd century. These are all Brunson's pieces. These are all in the book. And don't forget the tapes, by the way. Um, I think this is terracotta. This is another uh, Moorish 
person in Spain in the second century of the Common Era. This is Taharka. Now, Taharka is important in this story, because, not because he's a Moor, but because he also leads an expedition into Spain. And this is documented in Spanish uh, chronicles of the period he is mentioned as Taraco, or Taraco, T-R-R-A-C-O. And of course, we know him as Taharka, the greatest king of the 25th dynasty. This is a tough brother, a great builder, a very pious man, under whose reign Kemet was stabilized for quite a long period of time in the 7th century before the Christian era. And here he is again. And here he is again. Now, this is a black Spanish Christian actually going into combat to fight the black Moors as they moved into Spain in the 8th century. And there's a detail. Very regally dressed. It has been argued, uh, I should have gone into this before I turn the lights down, but let me just summarize it now. That the whole idea of knighthood and chivalry is even non European. And I would think that's consistent. Um, I just finished reading a book called The Kindness of Strangers, and it's literally about the abandonment of children in medieval Europe. That's not African. And the shameless notions that we find associated with Errol Flynn on Saturday afternoons on TV do not seem particularly European to me. Um, the idea of honor and grace, you know, in battle does not seem to be European. Now, some people would argue that this is derived from the legends or the works of a black man known as Antar or Antara, sometimes called Antar the Lion, who is the greatest figure of pre-Islamic South Arabia. He is a knight, he's a poet, and you can do a lot of documentation on Antar. By the way, in terms of Arabia, the first Arabians are black people. And even at the time of Muhammad, Arabia to a large extent, to a large extent, is still relatively black. Muhammad's grandfather, Al Mantalib, is the most important man in Arabia, by the way, because he was the Sharif of Mecca. And it was his function, the function of him and his tribe known as the Quraysh to guard the sacred Kaaba stone and meteorite. He fathered ten sons, it is said by ancient accounts, each of whom was as black as the night and magnificent. One of them was Abdallah, who became the father of the Prophet Muhammad. In Arabia, at one time, things were very hot for the early Muslims. And Muhammad said, look to Africa, look to Ethiopia, go there, because you will find a king and a land of righteousness there. And these men greatly impressed when they came back to Arabia, they greatly impressed um, Muhammad. And he saw fit to make the statement that he who brings an Ethiopian man or an Ethiopian woman into his house, a black man, a black woman, brings the blessings of God there. The law is so important, a black man, that he's identified as the third of the faith. You have the first Muslim to die in battle, a black man. And some of the earliest and greatest of the Muslims were black. And these are Arabs to a large extent. Now, this is a Moor in the back, in, along with an Arab. Moor civilization is confusing because while the term Moor means black, Moor civilization is not quite that simple. Once again, the Moors in Africa are called by the Arabs Berbers. In Europe, they're called Moors sometimes, and other times they're called Saracens. And then when it comes to Moor civilization, you have the, the mixture. You have the blacks and different groups of Moors, by the way, coming in at different times. Then you have Arabs and different groups of Arabs with white Spanish Christians, with Jews, many of whom may have been black. I'll show you one in a moment. And, and the whole intermixture that takes place over six or seven hundred years. Moors. This is supposed to be a Moor and a Jew uh, overseeing the conquest of the island of Mallorca in 1469. Moors and Arabs and white Spanish Christians. Same thing. Now, what 
I'll do it in the future. Next time I come through Brunson, send me these. Now, see, this is the kind of person where Milko is. I just cut all that out and just have a, a, a close-up <laughs> of the brother. <laughs> now, these are Moore's Lane seeds to uh, Palermo, Sicily. This is supposed to be a black Moorish giant, actually a Saracen giant. He's, in, he's documented in a publication called the book, no, 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 The Song of Roland, a medieval epic. Uh, Gerald Massey argues that Stonehenge, this is a megalithic monument on the Salisbury Plain, 60 miles southwest of London, was actually constructed by black people, specifically by men known as Morian. And the quote of exactly says, now, as a Morian, as a Negro is still known in English as a Morian, may not the builder of Stonehenge may have been the Morian, uh, you know, one of the great Kushite builders or something to that effect. And it's also been pointed out to me by an African that among the Lorma community in Liberia, the name Morian is still very prominent. For a long time in the Dutch language, uh, the word Morian was used as a synonym for a black African, so-called black African. Now this is a picture of uh, St. Maurice, the black uh, patron saint. St. Maurice was a military saint. Two years again, I talked about the banner of St. Maurice that was taken into battle in the uh, German crusades against the Slavs. St. Maurice on one side, and on the other side is St. George. You heard of St. George and the dragon, that's the dragon beneath George's feet. Now, most of us have heard about St. George, most of us have heard about St. Michael or St. Somebody or the other, but very few of us have heard about St. Maurice. Now, these are important too. Um, I'll show you a series of black Madonnas in Europe that exist, coincide with the uh, depictions of St. Maurice. These are icons of medieval uh, Christian Europe. Of course, they are the derivatives of Isis and Horus, the black Madonna and child. Some of them, for example, the one I just showed you, I believe even have Isis and Horus carved on it. Or uh, Aset and Henry, the African names. The name Aset or Isis means the throne. And of course, Henry was identified with the noonday sun, but here he is also in a, um, the form of, of the infant. The virgin birth, immaculate conception, is merely a story, uh, an ancient African story, as repeated to Plutarch. Of course, this is Isis. Uh, Isis is the wife of Osiris, who was slain. His penis cut away, thrown into the Nile River, where it's swallowed by a catfish. Uh, no, no problem. Isis uh, recovered the body, got everything but the penis. The, uh, prayed to the gods of Egypt to restore life back to the slain Osiris. And she, in that same form, while he's prostrate, uh, prostrate, uh, <laughs> she grows wings and flutters over the body and becomes pregnant. And that's where Horus comes from, or Haru. His whole function is to avenge his father's death. And he grows up and it proceeds to do exactly that. He's got his uncle Set, who is his, who is his father's murderer, uh, on the ground. He's about to kill him. And it's Isis who intervenes. Now these are deep, deep, deep concepts that are to come forth in major world religions. But that's not what we're here for tonight. But let me just go through these because these exist at the same time as the black saints. And people might think in some cases that the St. Maurice is an isolated phenomenon. That this is a part of a wider concept of black religious icons in medieval Europe, and very important ones at that. The holiest icons in medieval Europe are regarded as these um, black Madonnas and child. These are regarded as miracle workers, in fact. Uh, before Napoleon's army was defeated by Kutuzov at the Battle of Berdino, I think in 1802, Kutuzov forced his troops to pray before black Madonna. Before Joan of Arc launched her great crusade, she prayed before Black Madonna. When the first crusade was launched around 1200, it was launched in the French city of Lupe at the shrine of the Black Madonna. All over Spain, all over Italy, Portugal, France, Switzerland, Belgium, you name it, Black Madonna's figure very prominently. This is from uh, Russia. Another one. Beautiful piece. 
you know the whole story about this though, is that they really aren't born black originally, that they turn black. And the reason they turn black is because of the smoke and soot from incense and candles. I always say that the smoke was very intelligent because it didn't accumulate on the clothes, it just got on the faces and the hands. And then some people would say, well, I see those are dark Madonnas, they're not black. Because black people don't look like that. Well, who? Black people range from snow to crow. And you have Ethiopians that look to be precisely like that. Of course, another theory is, is that many of them were originally much darker and that they were so important as icons that they were literally taken into battle. For example, you could see this one with the cuts on her face. And those are sword cuts because the icons were thought to bring big victory in battle. Many of them were destroyed and eventually they would rebuild them and reconstruct them. But they may not have black models, so they would still make them dark. Many theories. Um, isn't that a beautiful piece? I think that's from Yugoslavia. I think. And also, consistently, once again, this is not, um, I mean, this is normal when it comes to depicting icons in early Europe. This is um, not a Madonna at all. This is a depiction, I just wanted to show this, of the um, a Palace Athena. Of course, Palace Athena is the most important of the Greek goddesses. And here she is depicted in a black form. This is from southern Russia. This is about 2,000 years old. Palace Athena is the most powerful of the Greek goddesses, and she is derived from an African goddess known as Night, N-E-I-T, that we find distinguished in northern uh, Africa, Kenya, as well as Libya. And this is from Persia. Now, why would I show this here? Because, once again, many of the, um, oftentimes, the Muslim populations in uh, Spain, including the Moors, were indiscriminately known as Saracens. Now, two, three things about that. First of all, the word Sarah. Sarah is the wife of Abraham. And she's very prominent, which is not very typical of many women in Western Asia. And most of Western Asia, and Asia in general, the woman, generally speaking, is seen as a mere extension of the male. India, of course, is a classic example of that with um, the concept of the Sutti. Whereas when the head of the household died, the head of the household being lord and master, it is, was the function of the high caste Hindu widow to jump on the cremation fire and to take her own life so that she could continue to serve her husband and lord into the next life. That's the most extreme case. But in Western Asia, you have similar examples, but for some reason, Sarah is very prominent and she has a life of her own. Um, that thing, I think that is typically African. Because in Africa, you have a major focal society where the female is, is the basis. Once again, we talk a lot about Osiris or Asar, but the name Isis means the throne. That's the seat of power. In order to be the king in Egypt, you had to marry the royal female. And you have some cases where you have women who actually exercise full power. Now, Sarah seems to be typical of that, but um, and that may be the basis of the word Saracen. This is supposed to be a depiction of her. Um, and in addition to that, you have the word Kara, a car, K A R A, which is the Turkish word that literally means black. Now, this is a, I don't know what we got here. This is either a, a black Madonna that is so black that it has a bluish tint, or this may be a Madonna just based on symbolism. And this is one of the reasons we have confusion. Things are really not so cut and dried and simple, but this is a beautiful piece. This is from Montserrat, once again back in Spain. This is a black knight. It may well be a depiction of Sir Muriel. This is from the 15th century in France. Once again, the, the story of Morian is derived from a metrical romance that was originally called the Lancelot. You have Moors who figure prominently in um, Welsh folk tales. You have, for example, stories of Moorish boys encountered in Welsh folk tales called the Mabinogion sitting playing chess, or Welsh giants. Or there's somebody called the Black Oppressor. And he's asked, why you call the Black Oppressor? It's because I've done justice to no one. Now, I think that these concepts show a prevalence of Moors or black people in the history of Britain and Western Europe and it eventually begins to show them 
not as heroes, but as the defeated. And I think that's where the notion of the black knight comes into being. That whereas one time you have a prominent black or African presence, eventually with the defeat of these blacks, they become sinister forces in um, mythology and folk tales. This is Mule Ishmael. This is a great Moroccan or Moorish king. Many Moors also went back to Africa after they were expelled from Spain, and in many cases there to have dire consequences on African civilization. For example, you know that it was a group of Moors from Morocco with firearms who sacked the Songhai Empire and uh, crushed it, I think, in 1596, or perhaps it was the 1600s, the greatest of the existing African empires, the heart of which was Timbuktu, and uh, it is said that gold comes from the south, silver from the north, and salt from the land of the white men. But the treasures of God and the words of wisdom are only to be found in Timbuktu. That's an African proverb. Timbuktu is a university city. This is where the University of Sankara was located, where the ships were constructed, apparently, to launch the movement across the Atlantic by Abubakar II that had a profound impact on medieval American civilization. You know the story of Abu Bakr II who had two fleets of ships constructed. He was a, mu a Muslim, but he was not interested in Mecca. He wanted to see what lay beyond the far sea. He was interested in more than a rare snapper sandwich. Right? He wanted to see what lay beyond the far sea. Isn't that, isn't that the way it's projected? But African people had no interest in what lay beyond the sea. We were only interested in the sea as a means of sustenance. That kind of nonsense. Other people had a spirit of adventure. Africans didn't for some reason. We stood still. We were engaged by inertia. Abu the II has two expeditions launched and he's never heard from again. So his nephew, Martha Musa, becomes the king of Mali. At the center of the uh, empire, Mali, Ghana, and Songhai was a great commercial city and university city of Timbuktu. And the major university was the University of Sankara, or Sankara, S-A-N-K-O-R-E. Um, just to give you an idea as to how important this city was, or this university, and how impressive it was, an African university, um, that the Sultan, or the Askia of Songhai died, and this is the largest empire perhaps in the world at that time. Um, very wealthy, and would have occupied an area about the size of the United States or Western Europe today. And the, um, you have two rival princes who want to be the king, who want to be the sultan. It was a very wealthy empire, and one has an army and the other has an army, and they start from various sides of the empire, and they're going to meet at a predestined place, and he whoever is victorious on the battlefield will become the sultan of the world's wealthiest empire. And anyway, one of them on the way to the battlefield stopped at the University of Sankara in Timbuktu. And he asked the head chancellor, the African chancellor, to take him on a tour of the facilities, take him around, show him the library, introduce him to the faculty members, show him to the class, take him in the classes. This prince, this claimant, for the greatest empire, the wealthiest empire in the world at that time, decided after his tour, that he uh, would ask the chancellor of the University of Sankara at Timbuktu to write a letter to his, to, his, to his rival claimant, renouncing any claim to the throne, saying he really wanted to spend the rest of his life as a student in the city of books. That's impressive. African children need to know that. This is an indigenous woman from Algeria. This would be typical of a Moor. Once again, we don't have many reproductions of the Moors as they portray themselves in antiquity. We mostly have things done by Christians, but this is a Moorish woman from modern Algeria. So this is identified as a Moorish peace in pre-Columbian America about 900 years into the Christian era. Alexander von Wutenau says this is Moorish. This is uh, Ibrahim Hannibal. This is the maternal 